Vanity Fair, the July issue. The cover story is Call Me Caitlin, which hits uh, newsstands June 9th. And uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, Vanity Fair contributing editor, wrote Friday Night Lights. He's Buzz Bissinger, and he joins us now. How long have you known Bruce, now Caitlin Jenner? Or how long did you know Bruce Jenner, Buzz? You know, I obviously I knew of him, but I didn't meet him until I started doing this story. So that would have been around the middle of February, February 18th. What did you think going into this interview? Well, you know, I, I, I was excited in the sense that this is kind of a remarkable story. I was nervous, to be honest, in the sense that this is a hard story. And, you know, personally, we all want to be politically correct and, and express tolerance, which I think I hope we all have. But this is a weird story. I mean, let's face it. You know, I'm 60. I'm sure you remember. You know, I remember Bruce Jenner winning the Olympics in 1976. I watched the whole Olympics. We got our clock cleaned. Edwin Moses was the only individual person in the United States in track to win a medal. Russia embarrassed us. East Germany embarrassed us. And the saving grace was Bruce Jenner. You know, handsome, gorgeous, buff. I mean, I hated him. I was jealous of him. But he became a superhero. So, you know, that's the guy who was in my mind and now meeting Bruce's Bruce in the final months before transitioning. I mean, that, that's a mind bender. I just don't care what anyone says. It's a mind bender. We're not used to it. If we were, there wouldn't be this kind of, you know, excitement and curiosity over this story. I don't know how much it came up in the article that you did in Vanity Fair, but he was saying to Diane Sawyer that he's not a crusader. He's not an activist, but can you do this and have your reality show and win the Arthur Ashe Award at the ESPYs? And by proxy, aren't you an activist? Yeah, you are. And I, I, it's a good question, Dan, because I think what's happened is, is that he did not think he would be a crusader. I mean, you know, Bruce is Bruce was savvy. He's um, was savvy. There was the first athlete, as you know, to cash in on, on winning a gold medal. Uh, he monetized it, and then he was on the Keeping Up with the Kardashians. So he knows the public world well. But he was not prepared for the incredible response. You know, Diane Sawyer was 16.9 million. Vanity Fair has gotten, gotten 14 million hits. I mean, Caitlyn Jenner broke the Internet for, you know, most followers on, on Twitter, beat President Obama. And I do think it's had a really positive impact on energizing and making her realize I really do have a social calling. I can really uh, create great social change. So I have to be careful and responsible, particularly in that, re- you know, they call it a docuseries. It's a bunch of junk. It's a reality show. <laughs> and reality shows are often a bunch of junk which is why they wanted his first four kids to participate, and they said no. And it can go different ways. It can be a level of fun, which it should be, because it is fun. It's freaky. It's different. Or, um, you know, it, it's got to be leavened with seriousness, because whether she likes it or not, and I think she does like it, there is a big social responsibility now. What did you learn that you didn't know? You know, you have certain preconceived notions going in. I mean, I should say, because I'm, I'm not shy about it. You know, people say, well, how come you did it? Well, you know, I'm a good journalist. I've written a lot of stories for Vanity Fair. I've written, obviously, Friday Night Lights and other books. But there was a personal connection on a level. Um, you know, I cross-dress. I've cross-dressed in the past. I've written about extensively about my own gender confusion in GQ. And, by the way, I got mercilessly crucified for it. But that taught me a lesson about how hard it is to be different. And, you know, I mean, Bruce Jenner is Bruce. I have one one millionth of the public exposure that he's had. And so there was the common bond that, you know, it, this could be really hard. This can explode. This can backfire. And also this is sensitive. But what I learned was really globally just how much pain he went through as Bruce, as Bruce. how much agony, how much confusion, how much deceit, how much lying. And the, the one quote in the story that resonates the most to me is, he had his beard, you know, he went through a transition in the late 1980s. He started and then he stopped. He said he chickened out. But he had his beard removed. Having your beard removed, because I actually know about this, is really unbelievably painful today. And back then in the 1980s, was done with electrolysis. You know, it's, it's, it's each individual growth, so to speak. And I said, well, you know, at least you had pain medication. He said, no, I, don't, I didn't use pain medication. And I said, why? You're masochist? And he said, well, sort of. Because I felt I deserved the pain. I deserved the pain because of who I was. And that just nailed me wow. in the gut. And, you know, you, look, you've been around the block. We've been around the block. You know, you hear a quote that's been staged for, you know, media consumption. This wasn't staged. 
um, he felt ashamed, not because he was, was born a woman, but because he was tortured all his life. You know, and imagine it. You know, he got, almost got a part for Superman right after the Olympics. They said, well, you don't have enough stage experience. Bruce Jenner was one of the greatest actors of our generation. He acted for basically, you know, 60 years of his life. Was, but it, it sounds like this was cathartic in a way for you, Buzz, to be, to be around Bruce and identify with a lot of this and what he went through. Well, it was. I mean, and I don't, look, I don't want to presume, you know, he's on a huge stage. He's been on a huge stage all his life. But it was, it was fun and cathartic to just sit down with a subject and, you know, whether you want to talk about clothing, whether you want to talk about difference, whether you want to talk about the steps you've taken, how hard it is to be different, how you hope there's, it's tolerance, how can, how can you be sensitive to it. I was more sensitive to it. And also as a writer then, you know, I was very sensitive. that This is a very personal issue in which she really had no choice to go public, but it's one that's going to be handled with honesty and, and clarity and also a sensitivity. Because, Dan, when I wrote that story in GQ, I thought people would at least, and some did, you know, admire me for uh, being so honest. I got killed, man. I mean, I got killed. And I didn't see, I've never read the reaction because I went into rehab for a lot of things, not just shopping addiction, but my wife was traumatized. But could you imagine if Bruce Jenner tried to do this publicly 15 years ago? No, no. And people say, you know, if, you, if, if it was really serious, you know, why not do it after the Olympics? Why not do it in the 1980s? Come on. How? I guess, I guess you could if you wanted to be destitute. I guess you could if people would have, would have walked away from you because they consider you a freak. And it's not so easy now, despite all the advances. There was no way. Um, she would not have been able to make a living. She would have been mercilessly ridiculed. Um, you know, if she wanted to move to Antarctica or Iceland and really go deeply into hiding, then yes. But if she wants to make a living, if she wants to be a viable member of society, and I say it's not so easy now if you're a transgender man or woman, absolutely not. You couldn't do this. The only role model was Renee Richards, who was incredibly brave, but that was in the 1970s. And that's the only sports figure we knew of when she challenged the U.S. Pro Tour to, to play as a woman. But otherwise, that was it. In the 80s, no one knew about this. No one had really heard about this yet. Does Caitlin have a sense of humor about playing oh. golf that she gets oh, to yeah, play from the, the ladies' tees now and at uh, Sherwood Country Club? Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's the issue. <laughs> Interesting issue. Have you ever played at Sherwood? Well, I know there's a men's grill. Well, there's a, what bathroom? I mean, I'm not being facetious. I mean, there's all sorts of issues. You know, Sherwood is a great club, but it's pretty snooty. What bathroom does she use? What, what locker room? But the great thing about Caitlin is the, the use of the pronouns is confusing. This is all new for all of us, and, you know, only idiots like Neil Cavuto on Fox want to be purposely insensitive. Uh, we're all getting used to this. But Caitlin doesn't care. She says, I make this mistake. You know, sometimes I'll see someone on the talk on the phone and say, hey, it's Bruce here. And I said, oh, wait a second, I'm not Bruce, I'm Caitlin. But one of the segments on the show, and I think this will be fun, is um, she's a, Bruce's Bruce was a really good golfer. He had a 300-320 off the tee, which makes sense because he's a great natural athlete. And one of the segments is going to see how far she can hit it off the men's tee now that she has very ample bazoomies, and I've seen them, and they are very ample. And it'll be really curious to see. And that's the kind of sense of humor she has, because she says, look, you, you've got to have fun with this. You got to, the only way to demystify it and make people comfortable is to have fun and acknowledge that this is not an everyday occurrence. And I think that's, of all the things she can do, that might be the best. Because when it's demystified, when we no longer really care about it, then we know we've come a long way. I look forward to reading it, Buzz. Uh, good to catch up with you again, and uh, keep stirring it up. Uh, Dan, I have to ask you one thing. I was really right about Nick Foles, was I not? <laughs> come on, Dan. Fess up. Come on. I've come clean. Okay. Listen. Explain. Ex give, uh, give your point. Explain your point, just so people know what I, we're well, talking about. I wrote a piece in Philadelphia Magazine and <laughs> did a profile of Nick Foles in which it said he was a very, very uh, nice guy, had decent skills, but absolutely no leadership skills. Um, at all, and was kind of too gutless for his for his own good. And I, yet again, I was getting unfairly excruciated. And I went on your show, and you know, you said you just did this to stir the pot, and being typical Bissingerian, all of which was true, by the way. Um, <laughs> but after the season, Chip Kelly could not get rid of Nick Foles fast enough. 
to trade for a guy who may not be able to play because his knee is still bad, Sam Bradford. Having said that, I think Chip Kelly made a mistake. Today. Okay, but Buzz, in fairness, though, remember that you had Nick Foles who turned you down for an interview, and I said, did you write? Of course. You, you wrote, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of vitriol in there because he turned you down, and I, I said that, that that's where I had the problem with the profile on, or the article on Nick Foles. Dan, that is absolutely 100% correct. I mean, how would you feel if I turned you down? You'd be pissed at me. Yeah, but I I'm wouldn't. Teasing. I'm teasing. You're right. I, was, <laughs> I, I wouldn't I, have I, ripped you today and said that Buzz Bissinger turned me down and didn't want to come on the show. Well, I was, I was honestly upset because, you know, it was, and honestly, it wasn't because of ego. It was because, Nick, you're now the starting quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles under, you know, Dennis uh, second-year coach. You are the man. You are the person, and you've got to step up to media exposure. And I, had, I, I wanted to meet him. I never met him, and I wanted to talk to him because it was a Friday Night Lights connection, and he once said he identified, he felt he was like a character out of Friday Night Lights. And I was really shocked, and I yes, peeved when he said no. And I think that, you know, this is part of what you do, and part <laughs> of what you do is you know, cooperate with a legitimate member of the media who's writing a, a legitimate piece for the local. But media. some guys so aren't to... good though with it. Marcus Mariota is not good with it. It doesn't make him bad, a bad person, or uncooperative. He just some guys aren't good at being that that guy who is the face of the franchise. But you, you, I think you still have to do it, and certainly there are people, some who are really, really good. Would you have ripped him though, Buzz? If no, he I wouldn't. Did... Have. I wouldn't. Have. I actually, honestly, I would have liked him. I would have liked him because I, I, I heard, and I didn't rip him as a person, I heard, and that does come out in the story. I heard a lot of great things about him. He's very decent. He's kind. He works his ass off. And what I really do admire about Nick Foles, and, yes, I join the line, is everyone, everyone has always, always underestimated him, everyone, um, out of high school, out of college. And I think Chip Kelly may well have made a mistake because I think this year, last season, ironically, was good for him, A, because he grew up a lot, and B, because he – I thought he realized how much the Eagles needed him because Mark Sanchez was not going to be the man. And it's a complicated offense. It's not a good offense for him. The read option is just not good for Nick. It's I think business. Nick is happy to be out of there. I do, too. So I see your point. And, yeah, I mean, I guess there was vanity. But, on <laughs> Dan, I, I swear, there was no sense of wanting to pound on him. I think I would have found someone who's decent, grounded, works his ass off, and is shy and affable. And that's what I was trying to get at, because we in Philadelphia don't know a lot about him. We just don't. We just don't. And you never will. No, no we never will, but now we got <laughs> Sam Bradford, whose, whose knee is still bad, as I hear. <laughs> Thank you, Buzz. All right, Dan. Thank you, man. <laughs> Doesn't sound like Buzz has let that Nick Foles story go, but...